Kip, the common perception is, is that we understand relativity theory, we understand quantum theory, we know they have to be integrated, but pretty much we know all that's going on. But ha when you look at the future, what, what opportunities do you see for new physics, new ideas to emerge? Let me approach this by talking about old physics, okay? because it, uh, it sets the context. Newton gave us his laws of gravity. His laws of gravity say that uh, the Earth and the Moon attract each other through a force, the gravitational force. It's an action at a distance force. The Earth here, far away from the Moon, pulls on the Moon and put, uh, makes the Moon go in orbit around the Earth, uh, going in orbit to prevent itself from falling into the Earth. Centrifugal force ba balancing the gravitational force. So gravity was this action at a dis distance. Inverse square law, the farther away you go, the strength of the gravitational pull goes down as one over distance squared. Einstein came along, formulated the laws of relativity, and looked at them and said, my goodness, Newton's laws of gravity are not compatible with my laws of special relativity, my laws that space and time are personal, uh, my laws that there is no, uh, no absolute concept of simultaneity, and so you can't have action at a distance because action at a distance says simultaneous, uh, uh, this thing now creates a force here now. It's incompatible, I have to create new laws of gravity. Obviously I'm right, Newton had to be wrong. He, uh, Einstein had chutzpah. And so Einstein then formulated general relativity as a new theory of gravity. He explained the gravitational pull in a different way. It was due to a warping of time, due to the prediction that time flows more slowly near the surface of the Earth than it does far away. And uh, he was able to work through that, through some uh, four-dimensional geometry of space-time to explain gravity. Uh, so we had a completely different picture of gravity, that gravity is due to warping of space and time. Which one is right? After all, Newton's laws give absolutely perfect, to, as far as we can see, predictions here in the laboratory. Exceedingly accurate predictions in the solar system, not quite perfect. You do need a little bit of correction from general relativity. But is gravity an action at a distance or is it warped space-time? Well, we say today, obviously, it's warped space-time. And Newton's description is an approximation, but very good approximation. Today, we have a problem that, uh, that Einstein's laws of warped space-time uh, must be married with the laws of quantum physics in order to discuss things like the birth of the universe and what goes on inside black holes. These laws of quantum gravity, then, uh, must be the fundamental laws that govern gravity, and somehow Einstein's laws of warped space-time mm -hmm. must come out of them as an uh, approximation. And we actually, if string theory is the correct laws of quantum gravity, we do understand how Einstein's laws come out as an excellent approximation, but not really the truth. The truth is really string theory or okay. laws of quantum gravity. What will come next? These laws seem to be nested. Yeah. And you go from one to the next, as you go to higher and higher accuracy and greater and greater domain of validity, you go from one to the next, from Newton to Einstein to string theory. Does it end there? I doubt it. Uh, it could be that these are like nested Russian dolls, uh, that, uh, that you have one, then another, then another, but it goes all the way down to an infinite number of nests. Or it could be that string theory is the end. We don't know. I don't know. But having these three steps in front of me and having seen that the description of gravity by each of them is so radically different from the other, I can't help but wonder if there isn't something at a finer scale and finer scale yet that you keep on going down and there's never an end. Is there a required uh, spectrum from complexity to simplicity? as you go down and, or uncover the nesting? Uh, or is there anything that we can say structurally about this flow? Uh, I'm not a great expert. Yeah. I, I am on the first two steps, <laughs> not on the third. But when you step, I step back as a physicist and look at it, I am struck by the power of demanding that you deal with laws 
that are simple in some sense from the right point of view. So Newton's laws are very simple when you think of action at a distance. Einstein's laws are very simple when you think about warp space-time. Mm. You can reformulate Einstein's laws in a sort of a Newtonian sort of a way. They get oh, God awful complicated. And so, and then you go to string theory. The string theory laws are, are, well, they appear to be simple and elegant when you look at them from the right point of view. Uh, so simplicity is a touchstone in finding new physical laws, but simplicity combined with finding a new, a radically new point of view, and uh, it's not just simplicity itself. These aren't principles. These are guidelines in searching for new physical laws. The guideline of the combination of searching for new mathematical structures in which you will be, be able to come up with simple laws, uh, elegant simple laws, that explain the domain that you're moving into. Do you see an infinite number of these nesting? I mean, that, that, that seems quite, impossible. I mean, I, I hate to say anything's impossible, but, you know, I, I, and then you, you pick out any finite number. We have three potentially right now. And well, you know, <laughs> the book that uh, more than anything else made me a theoretical physicist convinced me at age 13 that this is what I wanted to do with my life. It was a book by George Gamow, mm. whose title was One, One Two, two three, three, Infinity. infinity. <laughs> Maybe I'm influenced by Gamow, right. but uh, just having one, two, three, <laughs> I can't help but wonder if uh, <laughs> there isn't a four, five, six infinity. Well, but we don't know. We don't know. We're far from knowing. You know, it's, uh, th th they say that any finite number is irrational. It would be irrational because <laughs> why that finite yeah. number? Infinity sort of has its own charm to it. it One would have charm. a charm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, none would have a yeah. charm That's also. Right. But, but, but any finite number yeah. it would be hard. But, but of course, we're now getting into philosophy that at this stage in our understanding of physics isn't terribly helpful. And so this is a philosophy that I'll talk about usually over beer, <laughs> not usually on camera. Sure. But, uh, uh, but for a physicist, this is an intriguing question, but we're not at a point where we have any way to come to grips with it. And so it's a question that we set aside and we just focus in at this stage on understanding quantum gravity and string theory on one hand, and then fleshing out on our understanding of relativity and warped space-time and uh, let future generations, uh, when <laughs> the subject's mature enough, when our understanding is mature enough, let future generations develop the tools to ask in a, mil million, in a definitive way, uh, is there a fourth layer and more? What is exciting is the, is the emergence of the previous layer from just flowing logically out of the elegance of, of the more fundamental layer. That's one of the keys to finding the more fundamental layer. The previous layer has to flow out of it. Uh, it must flow out, hopefully elegantly. If it's elegant, then as a rough rule of thumb, you're on the right <laughs> track. I love the word elegance, and I must ask you to enrich our understanding of how, how to describe that word. In physics, from a physicist's point of view, what's elegant? So let me describe it by talking about uh, two different people. Supramanian Chandrasekhar was a great astrophysicist, a close friend of mine, and for him the elegance was in the equations that sit on a piece of paper. He could look at them and he could say, these are elegant, they must represent truth. He could look at another set of equations and he could say, that really looks ugly. That can't represent truth. I've never understood how he had such great contributions to science, but he saw it in the mathematics on the sheet of paper. Uh, on the other hand, Stephen Hawking sees it all in geometric shapes in his head. Of course, he can't write equations on the paper, hasn't been able to since the mid-70s because of, uh, of his uh, motor neuron disease. But he developed these tools to think about physical law in geometric forms, manipulating shapes and topologies in his head. For him, elegance is all in these shapes and these topologies. Um, I don't think there's any uniformly agreed on idea of what elegance is, but uh, well, it's, uh, you know it when you see it, at least 
you know, it's a personal elegance in some sense, though, though there is certainly is a, a pretty universal agreement that general relativity is elegant, that quantum theory is not yet elegant <laughs> as it should be. How about the word beauty? Is beauty and elegance the same thing? In common parlance, they're not. They I think, again, it depends on the physicist. Um, for Chandrasekhar, beauty and elegance are equivalent. Uh, I think for me, looking at physical laws, that's also true. Um, that's not true in everyday life, but it is true for physical law. So how much does a search for elegance and beauty uh, affect you when you're doing the physics of relativity, black holes? So the search for elegance and beauty has been crucial in finding new laws of physics, uh, crucial since Einstein playing a crucial role today. I have chosen not to go th that route with my career. I prefer to work in a field where I have elbow room, <laughs> and uh, that's much, a much uh, more crowded field than <laughs> I do. So I have chosen to probe relativity, warp space-time myself. In this case, it is still true that searching for elegance in the description of, uh, of something in relativity, such as a black hole, uh, is an important thing to do because physical intuition, uh, being able to guess things before you compute them and then know what to compute in terms of a prediction such as that, uh, how black holes behave when they collide. Mm. Uh, that physical intuition has to be based on some mental pictures that in order for them to really be easy to manipulate, it's best that they be elegant. <laughs> so, in, in my sort of poor man's area of physics, <laughs> instead, of, instead of trying to understand fundamental, uh, to understand new laws of physics, elegance is still important in that way.